our custom has been to kind of have communion at the beginning of our services, and that's not going to change today. We're going to start with that. And I want to begin by this general understanding that a lot of people have, if they've ever attended church for any length of time, they're familiar with Jesus' servanthood statement in the parable of the talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Who's a faithful servant? Well, this refers to somebody characterized by steadfast affection or allegiance. You have been faithful, you've been reliable or trustworthy. Over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. How encouraging to hear those words. To be commended for a job well done or a life lived well. Whether on earth or in eternity, no one would ever refuse this kind of recognition. I know I wouldn't. I'd like to hear that. But getting there demands something. It demands faithfulness or being faithful. Regardless of the circumstances, this is especially relevant for those who walk by faith, those who claim to be Christians. And so we ask, what is faith? Well, it's a confidence that someone or something is reliable. This concept isn't hard to grasp since much of our lives are faith-based. Without it, I read, banks and post offices would not be possible. Think about it. Paper money and credit cards, the very word credit, is from the Latin verb to believe, would never be accepted. Who would take a credit card if they didn't have the confidence that that was reliable, that there would be payment? Of course, in the spiritual realm, specifically within Christendom, the core of biblical or saving faith is clearly spelled out by the Apostle Paul. Christ died for whose sins? Our sins. Just as the Scripture said, He was buried and He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. The question is, will people rest on these facts and accept them as being true, or will they reject them and retreat from the only one capable of cleansing their soul? God's love letter reveals the way to a restored relationship with Him. It's what we call salvation. And how is that? Through Christ's forgiveness. What our rebellion has severed, Jesus' blood has secured. If we desire to be right with a holy God, we must decide whether we're for or against His Son. There's no in-between wiggle room. There's no gray area on this. It is black or white. We're for or against His Son. This was a decision facing the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Do you remember his story? Pretty exciting. After... Paul and Silas realizing that they hadn't bolted from their open cells after being supernaturally freed, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved or rescued? And they said, Believe or trust in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You will be delivered from your sin, the penalty of it, and its future judgment. You, and if they follow suit, if they too believe, Your household. Some take offense at Paul's response. They claim, and I quote, it's too easy and simple a method of salvation. Just believe and you're in? Experience shows that simply believing is very hard for most people. Think about it. If salvation consisted of faith, plus let's say give $100 to the church, well, people would prefer that. Give me a mountain to climb. Give me a a river to cross. God's grace requires, requires that salvation comes as a gift. Bargaining and bragging are out. Believing and receiving are in. How do I know that? For by grace, through God's free provision, through Christ, you have been saved through what? Faith. Faith. And this, being saved, is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. 
not a result of works, so that no one may boast. In the context before us, notes one Bible scholar, and according to the rules of Greek grammar, which are very precise, very clear, this in Ephesians 2.8 refers to salvation. In other words, salvation, not faith, is the gift. The Holy Spirit is here speaking to believers. They have been saved due to God's grace, by grace, via the means of faith, through faith. In other words, God's grace makes salvation possible. That's the source of our salvation. And faith in the finished work of Jesus at Calvary makes the gift of God operative in our lives. Now, why start here this morning? before sharing in communion together. Why begin here? Because I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that God's offer of salvation is universal in scope, meaning He loves you. He sent His sinless Son to die for you. That means no matter how lost or low you are, there's room at this table for who? You. For you. The only responsibility on our part is to confess our wrongdoing before a holy God. To come clean that yes, whether in word, thought, or deed, I've violated at least one of your commands and that proves that I am a sinner by nature. And in the midst of that confession, believe in my heart on the Lord Jesus Christ who died and bore the price, the penalty for my wrongdoing so that God's justice could be satisfied and He could then extend to me His loving mercy and forgiveness. If an individual does that, they repent before God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus not only forgives, He adopts you into His Father's forever family. Or if you're a believer who's wayward, has been drifting in confession, He'll restore you with that fellowship with His Son. So I want you to think about what Jesus has done for you as this next song plays and before we partake of communion together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your eternal word that it is still just as applicable today as when it was first delivered through your apostles, the prophets, the messengers that were your uh, spokespersons. God, thank you for how you want to impact our lives today in this service, in this moment. And I pray that each of our hearts would be ready to receive what you have for us and it might truly make a difference in the week ahead. We are a people of faith. We live and walk by faith. And as we continue to explore that subject, that topic, that vital aspect of a spiritual walk, I pray that you would have your way in each of our lives today. Dear Holy Spirit, enable me to share this word and to give glory to Jesus because of it. It's in his name I ask it, and God's people said, amen. Have you uh, ever noticed how certain words are incomplete without their twin or better half? For instance, I say peanut and you say? Or I say peanut butter and? You got it, it's not sauerkraut. What about razor? Blade, Fast and, some of you like that series. they got to stop making those movies. Eggs and, bacon. The same trend occurs in Scripture. Adam and, or Cain and, Noah and the ark. Oops, I just gave it to you. Come to mind. I'm so excited. Along with Daniel and the, lion's den, or the widow's, might. Give yourself an A+. Plus. Don't forget James' contrast between faith and works or the connection between faith and patience highlighted by the writer of Hebrews. You may recall his exhortation to believing Jewish readers to imitate those who through faith, strong confidence in or reliance upon God, those who through faith and patience long endurance, literally, of pain or unhappiness, those who through faith and patience inherit the promises, like Abraham, 
who after he had what? Patiently endured or waited, obtained the promise. Of course, we all relish waiting, don't we? Especially when it involves pain. Especially when it involves unhappiness. Or do we? Not so much. Regardless, I was surprised to learn how inseparable faith and patience are. Beginning with Paul's encouragement to the suffering saints at Thessalonica. We ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. For what? Your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. In John's revelation vision of the tribulation, he recognizes the perseverance or patience and faith of the saints. Here is the perseverance, the steadfast endurance of the saints, he writes, who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Perhaps the best passage linking faith and patience is found in the New Testament book. It's kind of a, a fluff book uh, by the title of James. Count it all joy when you meet various what? Trials or trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your what? Faith produces or puts into effect steadfastness. It, it, it puts into effect patience or, or perseverance, a.k.a. spiritual backbone. And let steadfastness or this patient endurance have its full effect or its whole result, that you may be perfect or mature and complete in every respect, lacking nothing. What a transformative outcome. But only, only as we survive our trials with our faith intact, we need to come through them on the other side, still believing that God is good, loving, trustworthy, and faithful. I'm reminded of the Sovereign Lord's challenge to Ahaz. That was one of Judah's kings. As he and his subjects were under siege, Isaiah exposes their fear. He writes, the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. But God's message to Ahaz was very hopeful. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. And then God issued this warning. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So Ahaz, stand firm. Are you beginning to grasp the connection between faith and patience? That there's a very real link between the two? Commenting on the latter, William Barclay elaborates, the word never means the spirit which sits with folded hands and simply bears things or submits to defeat. Oh, woe is me. I'll be patient. That's not what he's talking about. So what kind of patience is this? It is victorious endurance. Masculine constancy under trial. Can we still use the word masculine? Thank you. It is Christian steadfastness, the brave and courageous acceptance of everything life can do to us, and the transmuting of even the worst into another step on the upward way. It is the bold and triumphant ability to bear things which enables a man to pass the breaking point without breaking and always to greet the unseen with a cheer, even when making decisions that will trouble others or stretch your own soul. Last Sunday I quoted Oswald Sanders who linked faith with vision. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. His faith imparted vision. But then in a reference to those great hall of faith characters in Hebrews chapter 11, and now it's time to turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. Take your Bibles and go there with me. Page 1069 in the Burgundy Covered Pew Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Sanders makes this observation. Each of the worthies immortalized in Hebrews 11 
was an individual of vision and decision. First, they saw the vision. Then they counted the cost, made their decisions, and acted on them. Question, when it comes to making choices for you personally, do you ever wrestle with the process? How many ever wrestle with the process? Have you ever wondered why it's so hard? Like the tennis match, the ball's here, it's there, back, blah, 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 blah. Then it hits the net and shears off, and you're just going, ah! Well, I have an answer for you. In most decisions, the root problem is not so much in knowing what to do as in being prepared to live with the what? Consequences. That's the rub. How am I going to handle what's coming because of what I have decided? What profit then, what benefit in following the faith example of those who patiently endured? Because faith is the assurance It's the substance. It's the realization of things hoped for or expected. It is the the conviction, the evidence, the sure confidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders, the ancient forefathers, obtained a good testimony, a great reputation. This was demonstrated last Sunday as we began our Hall of Faith tour. Do you remember it? Did anybody go home and finish the tour for yourself at home afterwards? I mean, the guide was still there, right? He wasn't. He would have kept going with you. Well, here's what we learned. Biblical faith worships like Abel. It walks like Enoch. It it works like Noah. And it it waits like Abraham. These, These Old Testament stalwarts not only believed in God's existence, they drew near to Him, seeking His face while trusting His promises. And faith is literally living in the light of what God has said, taking him at his word. What he has promised to do, he will do. Resting in what he has done or is doing and entrusting the future to whose care? His care, regardless of what it entails. This is illustrated by some of Israel's renowned patriarchs as we resume our Hebrews 11 tour. And you know what I'm grateful for? Their humanity, if you go through the Old Testament, is is on full display. We think they're in the hall of faith. These people must have had it. They must have been perfect. Uh, How else could they have gotten in the uh, hall of faith? But you read their story. Oh, they had all kinds of ups and downs. That encourages me. We're also going to see as we make our way down through the rest of this, how faith in God overcomes worldly opposition. You ever find any opposition in the world? Anyone hostile to you because you believe in Christ in the world? Well, faith can help with that. Look at verse 20, Hebrews chapter 11. Did anybody lose the page number? 1069. And you'll be right there. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning what? Things to come. This is looking ahead, the future. By faith, Jacob, when he was what? Dying. So he's not going to live to see the future but he knows there's others that will. He blessed each of the sons of Joseph. Interesting story, right at the last moment, he switches hands and reverses the blessing, part of God's plan, and gave instructions concerning, excuse me, I've got down to Joseph. He worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel. He believed that that was going to come to pass, as God had said, and gave instructions concerning his bones. When God takes you out of here to the promised land, take me with you. By faith, Moses, verse 23, when he was born, was hidden for how long? Three months. How easy is it to hide a three-month-old? By his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command who was ordering those Hebrew babies to be killed. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, not my family any longer, choosing rather to suffer affliction or mistreatment with the people of God, the Israelites, than to enjoy the passing or temporary pleasures of sin. Fellowship with God meant more to him than that. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, the reviling because of Christ, the outcome because of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And Egypt had some treasures. 
Why did he do that? For he looked to the reward. He was looking down the road to what was to come by faith. He forsook Egypt. He left the world in the rearview mirror, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What is faith? The assurance of things hoped for. The evidence of things. The conviction of things not seen. Moses knew that God had his back. That a better day was coming. So he endured by faith. He never flinched. He held staunchly to his purpose or calling. And because of that, verse 28, by faith, he kept the Passover. When? On the night before they exited Egypt and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were decimated. They were drowned by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Does that make sense as a strategy in wartime? We're just going to defeat you by just walking around you seven times for seven days. And on the seventh day, we'll do it seven times. We'll blow the horn and say, oh, boom. Makes absolutely zero sense. But they did by faith, and they came down. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So what's going on here? Seas are splitting and massive group of people are walking across on dry ground. Armies are being annihilated by those same seas brought back over them. City walls are collapsing and they weren't thin walls made of balsa wood. And harlots are being what? Helped. How? In every instance through overcoming faith in God and God alone. When Rahab spoke with the two Jewish spies that Joshua dispatched, she told them how the heart of Jericho's residents had melted for fear. All of Israel's foes had been divinely crushed, causing Rahab to confess, I know that the Lord has given you the land. The Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And then she did something. She let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall. When it comes to matters of the heart or, or exercising faith in the living God, it doesn't matter who you are or what you have done. When it comes to matters of the heart, the stuff that really counts in life, or exercising faith in God, it does not matter who you are or what you have done. For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God, no matter who they are or what they've done, must first believe that He exists, that He is. And, here's the best part, that He rewards those who do what? Seek Him. God, you're not only there, and I believe that, I'm going to come after you. Look at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For, for the time would fail me. The, the clock is ticking. I've only got ten minutes left in this message. This is exactly where he's at. To talk about Gideon and, and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets and... Uh, what a group of outstanding believers are in verse 32. I mean, these people, they're, they're the superheroes, right? Let's talk about timid Gideon. Where was he threshing the wheat when it came time to threshing the wheat? He wasn't up on the hilltop where the wind comes and blows the heavier stuff, the lighter stuff away from the heavier stuff. The chaff goes down and the wheat you keep. He was down in the wine press for fear of the Midianites. What a brave guy Gideon was. Timid Gideon. Let's talk about fickle Barak. Refusing to go into battle without Deborah the prophetess by his side. I'm not going out there unless you come with me. <laughs> and she did. Let's talk about mighty Samson. A moral what? Failure. Let's talk about rash Jephthah. Living to regret a sincere but hasty decision. Do you remember his story? Whatever greets me when I come home from this battle, if I'm victorious, I will 
sacrifice to the Lord. And who came busting out the door when Papa came home? His daughter. King David, a man after God's own heart, yet guilty of murdering an innocent man. And successful Samuel, prophet, priest, and judge, though his sons failed to walk in his ways, leading Israel to demand a king. Your sons are miserable judges. We want a king so we can be like everybody else. We should all be encouraged. Despite their frailties, despite their failures, each one of these characters receives an honorable mention in the great hall of faith. How on earth did they get in there after all that? Well, let's find out. Verse 33, through what? Faith. Faith. These same individuals subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. They became valiant in battle. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women even received their dead, raised to life again. And others oh, were what? Tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mockings and, and scourgings. That sounds fair. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. You know what that is? They didn't have chainsaws back then. That was the old-fashioned way. That might have been too graphic. I'm sorry. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. How comfortable was that? Being destitute, afflicted, and tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains in dens and caves of the earth like a, like a pack of rats. Two groups are prominently contrasted in the verses before us. Group A, in verses 32 through the middle of 35, is characterized by praise, success, and triumph. Group B, the remainder of verse 35 down to 38, is characterized by pain, suffering, and trial. Question, which group do most Christians prefer? Hands down, group A's following is larger than group B's. And for good reason, we loathe hardship. Despise it. Want nothing to do with it. If given a choice between the path of least resistance and the one that looms large, the former almost always wins. We gravitate towards comfort. It's in our DNA to clear steer, uh, clear steer, to steer clear of struggle. To, to circumvent conflict, which in my mind explains why Jesus' disciples wanted to go around uh, Samaria, where the half-Jews were, rather than straight through, as Jesus said, I must needs do. But a life of faith or walking with Christ, what does it include? It includes group A and group B moments. It's part of the whole package, right? We can't have one without the other. It's part of life. The success of the first group, in my mind, stimulates our faith. It, it motivates our faith. While the suffering of the second group strengthens our faith. Strengthens it. Puts, puts some metal into it. One source says this, A life without affliction and self-denial... A life without the cross is not likely to be preceded, is not likely to precede the life with the crown. The cross precedes the crown. Another writes, faith in God carries with it no guarantee of comfort in this world. But it does carry with it great reward in the only world that ultimately matters. And Jesus would agree. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. You're going to get knocked around. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And we too may overcome because our faith, like those in the great hall of faith, is bound to one greater than ourselves. 
For everyone who has been born of God overcomes what? The world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith in who? God. Not faith in self. Not faith in circumstances. Not faith in the clergymen. Not faith in the church. Not faith in the coffers or any creed. But in the one of whom Peter declared, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's where our faith needs to be. In Him. Like Peter and the apostles post-Calvary's resurrection, we look back on Christ. How do we do that? By faith. While the Hall of Faith heroes were always looking ahead. How? In what? Faith. Look at verse 39. We're almost there. And all these, previously listed, from both groups, having obtained a good testimony, a good name, God's A+, plus, through what? Faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect or complete apart from us. Now what's that all about? Well, let me do some reading for you. From righteous Abel to those whose faith was so nobly manifested on the very eve of Christ's coming, observes one scholar, they all won their record for faith. Some of them, as we're told in verse 33, obtained promises, but none of them received the promise in the sense of witnessing its fulfillment. They didn't live to see the fulfillment. They lived and died in prospect of a fulfillment, which none of them experienced on earth. Yet so real was that fulfillment to them that it dispensed power to press upstream against the current of the environment and to live on earth as citizens of that commonwealth whose foundations are firmly laid in the unseen and eternal order. Their record is on high and on earth as well. For what reason? For the instruction and encouragement of men and women of later days. And who is that? Us. Look at verse, chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, we also, those living in the present, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those who lived by faith in the past, those great hall of faith nominees and characters, let us in the present lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Commenting on the this unique relationship between Old Testament saints and New Testament believers, as expressed in verse 40, our scholar concludes with this. But now the promise has been fulfilled. The age of the new covenant has dawned. The Christ to whose day they looked forward has come, and by His self-offering and His high priestly ministry in the presence of God, He has procured perfection for them. And uh, for who else? Us. With us in mind, God had made a better plan that only in company with us should they reach their perfection. They and we together now enjoy unrestricted access to God through Christ as fellow citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. The better plan which God had made embraces the better hope, the better promises, the better covenant, the better sacrifices, the better and abiding possession, and the better resurrection which is their heritage and ours. Exclamation point. To which I can only say, come high water or low, praise the Lord for belonging to His forever family above. And being able to walk by faith as we journey here below. Praise the Lord. And by the way, on this journey here below, there will be hope-filled days infused with God's abounding goodness. Those are the mountaintop experiences. Those are the days we, we relish and enjoy and say, thank you, Lord. But there's also going to be days of what? We have to flip the coin, don't we? Days of despair. And I quote, when hope wavers, when fear 
creeps in and worries arrive. Sometimes a deluge of worries. What then? Well, in those moments, faith tucks tail and runs, doesn't it? Is that what they're trying to get across? No, faith, faith steps up, as one author shares. Faith still declares that because God is good, because He is loving, because He is full of compassion and full of grace, He might very well answer me today. So I'm going to keep on crying out to Him. However, if He does not, it is because He has something else in mind, maybe even something better And so I can remain strong. I can remain obedient. I can remain hopeful. More on that next Sunday as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our what? Faith. But let's end with this song, By Faith.